time. All right, second graders, I am turning it over to Mr. Pinckney, our wonderful author, illustrator, and community member friend. They're all yours, Mr. Pinckney. Well, good morning, second graders. And um, so I'm going to start uh, each session. I try to start a little differently. So which is kind of uh, be nice to see them all together and, and see, um, um, uh, you know, how I approach my work in very different ways. And um, so this morning, I thought what I'd do would start out with a process first, and then I'll go into education and um, my growing up years. But I, I wanted to make sure that one of the sessions that was very clear about the process of how I go about making books. So I thought we would start there. So um, in most cases, I work with a collaborator, an author, and someone writes a story. The process is, is this. Someone writes a story. You write a story. Uh, you're interested in me illustrating it. And it's, it's, it goes to a publishing house. And then the publisher might um, contact me to find out whether I'm interested in doing your story. So I either say yes or, or no to that. So it starts out with a text, a story in place, and I'm asked to illustrate it. Now, what is illustrating a text? What is that? What it is, is I interpret the story. My art grows the story, makes it more complete. It is both text and visual. So I work with, not with the author, by the way, I work with the publisher. And um, so I'm given a manuscript and it's in form of text only. There are no suggestions at all about what I am to illustrate. That's my role. That's what I do. So I figured out different ways to approach it. One way that I like very much that works for me, and that's the beauty I think of, of the arts is that you all, you have to find your own way uh, to enter into different projects or to work on different projects. So in this case, I'm given a text and you see here uh, the text. And then what I do is, and a lot of artists work this way, they create what you call a thumbnail sketch. And a thumbnail sketch is really kind of a shorthand for um, um, a, a getting to an idea or uh, exploring different possibilities because you can't illustrate every line in a story. So you have to make, the, the artist has to make a decision, what part of the text am I going to illustrate or interpret? So this is a thumbnail sketch and they can be done, you know, any size um, the, the, the artist chooses, but they're usually small. And it allows the artist to actually um, explore different, a lot of different possibilities quickly. So you'll see. This is a sheet. And you see how many possibilities there are. Then I go back and I select which one I want to develop further. Now, um, that's one way of working, and that's the collaboration. With this is the author is the poet, Nikki Grimes. Uh, there are other ways that I approach illustrating a book and that is where I write the text as well as do the, the, the pictures. And, um, and that's quite different. Oftentimes that starts with the art first. And in the case of The Little Mermaid, I started with sketches, not thumbnail, but sketches. These are larger drawings of what I thought the visual possibilities for this particular book. So this will give you some sense of how many drawings I've done. You can see a whole stack. And this is not all of them. Um,
and they can be unlike the thumbnail sketches, quite large, quite large. So at one point when I sort of in my head became that visual storyteller, in other words, I'm telling the story first with pictures, I began to write the text. And um, I, read, I wrote the text, see this is really upside down before, remember I said that most oftentimes when I work with a collaborator, the text comes first and then the art. In this case, the sketches came first. And then I wrote the text to fit the pictures. Because I'm, and in a sense, I'm a visual storyteller. So that is how The Little Mermaid was created. First with pictures and then the text. And I want to share the text with you and some of the pictures. First, I, I love that. This is, a, this is what you call the end papers. Um, and here, what I wanted to speak to visually was the mystery as well as the beauty of the underseas. Okay, so you guys ready? The Little Mermaid by Jerry Pinkney. Now, by the way, the original mermaid, uh, the story of the Little Mermaid, was by Hans Christian Andersen, uh, and it was later adapted um, for a film by Disney, The Little Mermaid, and you guys might know it. And I think it's due for a live action coming up soon, sometime soon. So this is the text. I'll show you the art first. And of course, this is the story about the girl who is a mermaid who gives up her legs to explore land. Far out in the ocean and miles below the surface, two realms sat divided by sea mountains. On one side of the ridge lived a powerful sea witch whose greedy heart cast a shadow over everything that tried to flourish. On the other side, the mermaid kingdom shimmered with light. There, the sea king and his four daughters dwelled in an elaborate coral castle. The littlest princess, Melanie, oh, by the way, isn't that a cool name? Uh, because she's a singer. So Melanie is her name. Um, actually, my wife, Gloria Jean, came up with that. She said, that would be a great name. I said, yeah, it's true. Um, the littlest princess, Melanie, possessed a beautiful voice, but she was not content to sing in the choir of mermaids like her sisters. She had no interest in sitting still on a royal throne. Instead, Melanie explored relics of sunken ships and invented stories in, about objects she gathered from the wreckage. Once, she discovered a curious figurine that looked a bit like her, but for two claw sticks where its tail should be. Melanie often wondered about the world beyond her home. Is it true that some ships glide atop the water instead of lying splintered beneath it? She asked her sisters. And that a ball of fire burns over the land. Now, the question is, Mr. Pinkney, How did you become an artist? Where did that come from? Well, I grew up in Germantown section of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, very large city. And um, however, there were no artists in my family or in the neighborhood, but we were all given tools 
pencils, and something to make a mark on. And especially the boys, for some reason or another, we were all encouraged to draw. Well, I found out not only that I loved drawing, but I was able to do, I was able to draw very well. As a matter of fact, when I compared the work that I was doing against my my friends, my buddies, and my other students in class, I discovered I was very good. Now that made me feel, you know, pretty special, right? That way you can imagine that made me feel special. But it also was important for me because when I was in second grade, I discovered that I wasn't able to read as well. I wasn't able to keep up with my fellow students. I wasn't able to complete certain assignments that our teachers gave me. Because at the time, I didn't know that. I didn't know until I was in talk, but I'm dyslexic. I have a learning disability or a learning difference. And I didn't know that when I was in second grade. So when I was in second grade, most of my energy was trying to figure out how I could get through the day without having to read something or to write a note or something like that. But I did want to contribute to the classroom. I wanted it also to be liked by my teacher. So I worked very, very hard in figuring out how I could find my own way to contribute to the classroom. Now, I had some great teachers, by the way, um, and they, they understood that uh, little Jerry loved and wanted to participate, but was having some trouble. So Mrs. Miller, she was my first grade teacher, my second grade teacher, she taught like English. And um, she made me a class artist. So whenever there was some possibility of me bringing up my grades with some special project, she offered it to me. And so I was able to participate in a way that other students couldn't as well. So even though that I was struggling with one thing, I excelled in something else. And that was important to me. And, um, and so I continued to that. And, and, and throughout my elementary school years, I was never a poor student. I was always a very good student because I really wanted, I wanted to learn. And I also learned something about myself, and that is I'm very curious. And you'll probably find that out when I walk you through my school, it was my, my studio, is that how much I love reading things. I'm curious. Um, so, and I'll share that with you. So, but still, I loved drawing, but it was for me. It was for that also to assist and to support my school, my schooling. It wasn't until I was 13 years old when I took a job selling newspapers as a very busy intersection in the Germantown, Philadelphia. And I would take a sketch pad because the sketch pad for me became my sort of safety net. It was a place where I felt most comfortable because um, when you're drawing, you don't have to spell. And um, I would take a drawing pad. So I always had a drawing pad. And I, my, my older sister also talks a lot about how, you know, I would disappear and I would be in my room drawing. I just loved it. And, um, but in selling newspapers, I was on a corner that oftentimes was not very busy. And when those times would, would, would be in place, I would just take out my sketchbook and do drawings. So I was constantly drawing. I would draw people waiting for the bus to the trolley. My aunt says it used to be a thing that people would say, hey, buy a newspaper from Jerry, you just might get a drawing. And I would actually sometimes give the drawings away. Um, but anyway, I would draw people waiting for the bus or the trolley. I would draw, uh, there was a large department store right across from my newsstand. And, um, uh, I would treat the window displays like a still life, like you would set up a still life. 
And when they would put new displays in the windows, I would do new drawings. So I was constantly drawing. Well, it turns out one of the customers who bought a paper newspaper from me, his name was John Liney. And he was a cartoonist. I had not known that. As a matter of fact, his cartoons, the comic strip Henry, actually appeared in the same newspapers I was selling. Here was the artist. And Mr. Liney saw me drawing one day and invited me up to his studio and um, looked at my drawings. And that made me feel really, really special. But one afternoon, I arrived, work early. I went to visit Mr. Liney in his studio. And in that space, which was a huge space, with projects stacked on the wall, and he had a drawing table, table in the center with a tabaret, which is where an artist keeps his materials. And how excited I was about that day. Because Mr. Liney, when he got up in the morning, and he went to work and he was able to provide for his family. He was doing the same thing that I would, I'd love doing. He was making pictures. So like Mr. Liney, can I invite you guys, you second graders, can I invite you into my studio? <laughs> okay, all right. So um, and, and my computer is on a little a, a, a roller, so uh, a music stand, so we can do that. So I remember I talked about. Here's the thing I want uh, I want you to kind of keep in mind, because I that one, and I'm going to ask you these questions. We have a question and answer period. I may end up asking you questions, and that is, do you think I love what I do? And um, that was one and whether you think I work very hard. And uh, also I'll share with you how rewarding my work is. So, so I'm gonna start here. Uh, right behind me, of course, is my table, a work table, uh, where I do most of the drawing um, and most of the watercolor uh, is done here. Most of the painting part is done at that desk there. So. Um, I'm going to share with you, I mentioned that John Liney, when I went to his studio, that um, he had this array of, um, of tools and materials that he worked with and on his work table, which is an artist called a tabaret. So you just learned a new word, a tabaret. So, um, and this is the art, my artist palette. Each artist um, palette will have a different look. And then I, you know, I've developed this way of organizing my colors so that you see it runs from very uh, bright colors like the yellow zone and then to reds, oranges, purples, blues, greens, and then the earth tones. Now, with watercolor, you activate this paint. It comes in a tube and you activate it with water. So comes in a tube like that. These are my brushes, and you'll see the question could be, Mr. Pinkney, why do you need so many brushes? Well, I never know exactly what I'm asking a brush to do. And so you'll see flat brushes. This is a fat round brush. And the brush I love and I use most often is a small brush like this. It's called a number six watercolor round. That's important. Now, there are other tools that I use. Of course, the pencil, 2B pencil. And I also work a lot of my sketches in markers. So this is where I keep my tools. And they're all readily at hand. And I'm going to spin around and give you a sense of uh, of my working space. 
and my tools. And you'll see that there is two work tables, two work tables. And one I shared with you is where most of my watercolor is done, even though there are sketches on my table um, right now. And this second table, work table, is actually where I do most of my working drawings. Well, Mr. Pinkney, what is a working drawing? Well, it's when you take a thumbnail sketch and you develop it further. Let me move my. So that is a working drawing, and then it's done in pencil. All right, so um, there are other things in my studio. Remember I talked about I was just the curious person. I love music, and I love collecting. And I've collected over the years. I also love the idea of taking care, care of plants. So this is a drawing I did. Let me move this easel out of the way. Um, this is another project. This was done for the U.S. Postal Service. I not only work for publishers, but I work for the U.S. Postal Service. As a matter of fact, I've illustrated and designed 11 stamps uh, for the U.S. Postal Service. This was a poster for a stamp uh, I did not create, but I did the poster for uh, Puerto Rican Day Parade here in New York. Uh, you'll see uh, lots of things hanging on my wall. This is the table where I do most of my writing. And also I have to take care of some of the business because what I do is also a business. So that's my writing table and that's where I have to sometimes pay bills. <laughs> and uh, there's my um, exercising bike, which is right in front of my library. And this is just a library, each of my bookcases it's a separate library unto itself. And in this case, it's um, books on nature. Now, I often use Google, but I prefer to use books. Now, I want to share with you, oh, this is this room here is where most often time you find um, I'm working on the computer itself. And again, what you see is other libraries. Um, in this case, of course, the, um, there are libraries of, that artists I, I, I'm fond of, and I want to about, know about more about their work and their lives. So you see those uh, library bookshelves are there. Here is a project that I've been working on. <laughs> Even when I say it, I said, I, that can't be. But this is a project I've been working on. And I've been working on this project for at least eight years now. It's my memoir. So it's my story that um, about how I grew up and how I became an artist. Similar, some, a lot of it is the stories that I'm sharing with you today about, uh, about the newsstand and, and, and John Liney. Uh, also the fact that there were no artists for me to look at as a role model when I was growing up. But it tells you a lot about this need that I had and passion and love for drawing. So this is a work table, and um, I have different workstations. And um, now we're going to go. And I did. I didn't uh, share this with uh, the last class, but uh, Mr. Cohen asked about this once before. This is where I store my art. So, and I have closets and closets of art. I don't throw anything away. And what I think will be special for today is, I'm gonna swing over here. This is called a working or drawing bench. And you see, I'm gonna straddle it. And I started a drawing this morning of the eagle, which I know is you guys, it's the mascot of the school. And oh, I'm going to spend some time 
um, drawing. And so what you're going to see is uh, the way I go about at least how I start an image. This is not watercolor, although who knows? It may be somewhere along the line. I think I might plan to add some watercolor. This is called, these are chalks or pastels. Now, um, I'm going to start with the um, pastel pencil. But pastels also come in a form of a chalk. So, Mr. Cohen, tell me what I have in terms of time. I lost track. We have 15 minutes. So, oh, last okay. about five minutes of this and then 10 minutes for the QA. Yeah. Okay. So, I started this with um, just an outline, and I'll you see, uh, I'll begin to start adding on and, um, and adding value. Value is just going from dark, light, shadows. I tend to also, you'll see one piece of reference tat um, on my board, but I tend to most oftentimes work with different sources, reference sources. And here you see me starting to add value. And color. Let me, let me develop the head area here. And you'll see uh, a little bit about how detail will start to bring some life to the image. So the chalk allows for broad, if it was a brush, it would be brush strokes. But you can see I put down large, what you call passages of the color. And I love the beauty of this is you can use your hands. I love that to blend. And what I like about the chalk, it's, it's almost like like uh, uh, paint, not watercolor, because watercolor is transparent. But you can do, you can put a light over a dark, which you can't do that uh, when you're doing with watercolor. And I'll and, and at some point I may have to show uh, how how that watercolor is different. That might be something I could share with you. They give you a sense of why an artist uses different mediums. So again, everybody, this started as a blank piece of paper this morning. What you saw in the beginning was the outline. Mr. Pinckney's doing work now. And after the sixth session, he's going to be sharing this with BV the final eagle. Isn't that pretty cool? All right. At this time, also, if there's any questions that you want to be um, answered, we're not going to unmute, but you can put them in the chat. And mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Cullen, let me know again what when I need to move back to the other desk so that I can start mm -hmm. answering questions. If you want, I'll ask you something while you're doing it. One of the questions, what inspires you to keep going? 
Um, I think it's it's pure the love of it at all. I enjoy it. Um, we probably each and every one of you has some piece of your life which you really truly enjoy. There might be lots of things, but um, there is that that one thing that stands out that gives you a sense of joy, um, a sense of for me it is as all I can do it well. Um, and I, so I appreciate the skill that I've developed and the, and, 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 and so the idea of enjoying what I do, and this is, I'm very fortunate and blessed that I can do it and still it's the way I earn a living. So that sort of keeps me going, but it's also that the work that I do that I love so much, I can also share it with you guys. So that's pretty special. Right now, I'm working on an exhibition that will be at the um, Montclair Art Museum, which will open February next year, uh, where the work that in my from my picture books will be on display in the museum. So there's a lot to keep me going. One of the questions is, how do you make those drawings look so realistic? Um, that is about practice. It's about, um, you know, of working very hard at knowing what you want out of a drawing. And my particular style is that of realism. I want my things to look real. I want you to be able to identify with them. Um, so that, that, that's important. So you work at it and that's going to be true whatever you decide when you find something you really truly love and i say you know you work at it but it's not like work work it's almost how you're developing something that you love to make it better and what happens if you make a mistake on a drawing um well <laughs> there's two ways of approaching it you can work with that and i don't use there are oftentimes you'll see in this whole process that where I will rub something out um, that isn't working for me. Um, but there are oftentimes the most interesting thing in creative work is you don't always know where you're going with it. There's mysteries in the art itself. It's mysteries or in and surprises in what you're doing. So I never consider it a mistake. What I do is I would change directions. If something isn't working well for me, then I will rework it. What, um, what was one of your more difficult books to work on and maybe one of your easier books to work on? Um, usually what happens is, is the more complicated the illustration is say for instance you remember we started out with the um the drawing of the the ship it was the bird's eye view of the freighter i said it was like 1810 so that was a very challenging first of all because i couldn't find any reference any direct reference that i could use so i had to invent it but i had to invent it and make you believe that it was that it was real that was real that you could reach out or 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 um or, or step on board the deck so that became very hard because i had to invent something that to make you believe it looked real so a lot of research went into it also there was a lot of detail now, that was one now right across from that there was my self-portrait that was a little easier simply because i can just look at myself in the mirror so the research was already done, was right there in front of me, um, where the other one I had to actually go to a source. So the more complicated an, a piece of art is, uh, the more, of course, it requires in terms of, of, of time and, and energy. And oftentimes, um, uh, there could be times when it isn't working as well as you'd like. What was your all-time favorite drawing? Uh, for one that you guys would probably 
connect to only because I shared it with you, and that was the drawing of uh, the cover for John Henry. That is, and then that it, it, there's a lot of meaning in that. It was a story that I remembered when I was growing up, so it has a, a personal meaning uh, for me. Um, and I just that I guess perhaps of all the images, um, it was something, it was the character itself, the content, but the John Henry character was important to me in my growing up years. Uh, let's see. What age were you when you made your first book? Um, I, my first book was in 19... 64 it was published in 1964 it was probably done in 1963 and um i was at that point i was 23 years old what advice would you give to a second grade author and illustrator um write if you want to be an author write write and do some more writing um and don't throw anything away and it's the idea of the practice itself because the more you write the better you'll become and above anything read and it's important because you understand you can learn writing styles you can get information it's how you get your resource um, your reference so reading becomes really important how do you choose the books that you're going to illustrate um, I tend to, there's usually the subject matter. I like to do, by the way, I like to illustrate projects where the content or the, the subject matter itself is something where I learn something. I mean, I don't like doing the same thing over and over again. I like new projects. So, um, so I look and say, what can I learn after I finish this project? And um, if I said, well, there's a lot to learn here then that, that's usually a, a project that I'm most, most interested in. What was the hardest book to make and why? Um, there was a book that I did. Uh, first of all, it was, it's, it, was over, it was over 80 pages, and it was called The Old African. And it was hard because it dealt with the history of, of people of color um, and coming to this country. So um, that was very difficult for me. Now, you know, there's always an upside to that because I did one of the books that gave me the most joy. If we talk about the most difficult, we could talk about the most one that gave me the most joy was a, a book which I'll share with maybe one of the other classes. And it's called I Want to Be. And it's a, a poem by Thylas Moss. Okay, any other questions from Ms. Goodman or Hanovich's class? By the way, I'll tell you something very interesting about going back to the, the hardest, um, you know, book that I ever illustrated. It's interesting is that sometimes the hardest book to illustrate, it's also the most rewarding book. Uh, because your investment becomes very, you have to put a lot into it. And when it succeeds, it's very rewarding. Yeah. This question is, why do you like drawing? Uh, it just makes me feel good. It's, and, and not only that, you ever, when I sit down to draw something, it doesn't exist until I put a mark down. And, um, and that's it's just a terrific feeling. So I'm not you guys, how many of you guys like drawing? Raise your hand if you like that. And well, one of the things I just sent your teachers um, something about writing back to Mr. Pinkney, but he told other people that you can share your drawings with him. He would love to see some of yeah. your illustrations. Yeah. I mean, it says, you know, I knew about my talent. Uh, partially was the fact that when I shared them with, with Mr. Liney. 
Hey, if anybody has, you can tell Mrs. Hanovich or Goodman, is there something about your artwork that you're wondering about? Did you ever get stuck on something? Do you have a question about something you're currently working on? Your teacher can put it in the chat. Mm -hmm. Now, a question that uh, we didn't talk about today is how many books I've illustrated. So I've illustrated over a hundred. Um, some of them I've I've also I wrote the text as well as the as doing the art. Now I'll say something else that that um, when you see me pause for. A, and consider what color I'm going to apply next. I'm not sure what that color is going to be. That's why I have like, you know, I'm holding the, um, I have a palette over there, which I shared with you. And now here, you'll see me holding up this um, array of, of, of pastels. And I'm thinking about what colors might complement what I've already done. Do you ever look at your drawing like puzzles? Like, you know, when I do a puzzle with the family, we like to do the borders first, you know, and then uh -huh. you work your way through pockets. And I'm, I'm watching you, you know, outline some of the out, you know, borders and small sections. How do you view the approach on this? Well, you see right now, in this case, I'm framing that head. Um, so that's my focus. So I tried to find, you talk about the puzzle and the edges. Um, I'm trying to define the, 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 the head itself. And um, because that's what where your eye tends to go. So I'm working on this. And so now that I've got the outline the way I want it to be, I'll move into other, other areas of the painting. But I needed something to make me feel like I was making some progress and the head is giving me that sense that there's actually progress being made. Good. We have one more, I think, and then we could kind of wrap it up unless something else pops in the chat. How do you know where your markings will take you? Do you always go off a picture or do you imagine it? That's an interesting question. There are times when I know exactly what I want and I work for that and towards it. There are other times I'm not so sure where I'm more exploring to see where the marks might take me. So there's a process, it's a give and take. So sometimes I know exactly what I want to happen. Other times I don't and I'm more exploring. Do you ever use math for drawing? Um, I think I would say yes, in as much as um, when I'm working on my book work, everything has to have a certain scale. And um, so everything has to be kept in a certain scale. There are times when I have to figure out uh, the amount of text because that has to be incorporated in the picture itself. So yes, uh, there is math. Uh, by the way, I never believed that I would ever have to use math in terms of, of art, but it's not that I learned shortly, very quickly, that that's not the case. Math, you can apply almost to everything. And of course, you need math in order to get paid. All right. Well, again, once this is all done, where you're going to get to see the finished project, and Mr. Pickney is going to take pictures after each of these sessions, so that we can see how this has began and how it goes along the journey till the conclusion. Uh, Miss Goodman's class wrote, "Thank you very much. This was very interesting. You all have been a great audience. Let's give a little more wave to Mr. Pinkney, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Now I can't wait. I, I mean, it's going to be hard for me to stop." And we're going to get and wait until tomorrow.